Letter sixty three of Clarissa Harlowe or the History of a Young Lady, Volume nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Clarissa Harlowe or the History of a Young Lady, Volume nine by Samuel Richardson. Letter sixty three. Translation of a letter from F. J. De La Tour to John Belford, Esquire, near Soho Square, London, Trent, December eighteenth. N. S. Sir. I have melancholy news to inform you of, by order of the Chevalier Lovelace. He showed me his letter to you before he sealed it, signifying that he was to meet the Chevalier Morden on the fifteenth. Wherefore, as the occasion of the meeting is so well known to you, I shall say nothing of it here. I had taken care to have ready, within a little distance, a surgeon and his assistant, to whom, under an oath of secrecy, I had revealed the matter, though I did not own it to the two gentlemen, so that they were prepared with bandages and all things proper, for well was I acquainted with the bravery and skill of my chevalier, and had heard the character of the other, and knew the animosity of both. A post-chaise was ready with each of their footmen at a little distance. The two chevaliers came exactly at their time. They were attended by Monsieur Margate, the colonel's gentleman, and myself. They had given orders overnight, and now repeated them in each other's presence, that we should observe a strict impartiality between them, and that if one fell, each of us should look upon himself as to any needful help or retreat, as the servant of the survivor, and take his commands accordingly. After a few compliments, both the gentlemen, with the greatest presence of mind that I ever beheld in men, stripped to their shirts and drew. They parried with equal judgment several passes. My chevalier drew the first blood, making a desperate push, which, by a sudden turn of his antagonist, missed going clear through him, and wounded him on the fleshy part of the ribs of his right side, which part the sword tore out, being on the extremity of the body. But before my chevalier could recover himself, the colonel in return, pushed him into the inside of the left arm near the shoulder, and the sword, raking his breast as it passed, being followed by a great effusion of blood, the colonel said, Sir, I believe you have enough. My chevalier swore, by God, he was not hurt, t'was a pin's point, and so made another pass at his antagonist, which he, with a surprising dexterity, received under his arm, and ran my dear chevalier into the body, who immediately fell, saying, The luck is yours, sir. Oh, my beloved Clarissa, now art thou, Inwardly he spoke three or four words more. His sword dropped from his hand. Mr. Morden threw his down and ran to him, saying in French, Ah, monsieur, you are a dead man. Call to God for mercy. We gave the signal agreed upon to the footmen, and they to the surgeons, who instantly came up. Colonel Morden, I found, was too well used to the bloody work, for he was as cool as if nothing extraordinary had happened, assisting the surgeons, though his own wound bled much. But my dear Chevalier fainted away two or three times running, and vomited blood besides. However, they stopped the bleeding for the present, and we helped him into the voiture, and then the colonel suffered his own wound to be dressed, and appeared concerned that my chevalier was between whiles, when he could speak and struggle, extremely outrageous. Poor gentleman! He had made quite sure of victory. The colonel, against the surgeon's advice, would mount on horseback to pass into the Venetian territories, and generously gave me a purse of gold to pay the surgeons, desiring me to make a present to the footman, and to accept of the remainder as a mark of his satisfaction in my conduct, and in my care and tenderness of my master. The surgeons told him that my chevalier could not live over the day. When the colonel took leave of him, Mr. Lovelace said, "'You have well revenged the dear creature.' "'I have, sir,' said Mr. Morden, "'and perhaps shall be sorry that you called upon me to this work, while I was balancing whether to obey or disobey the dear angel.' "'There is a fate in it,' replied my chevalier, "'a cursed fate, or this could not have been.' But be ye all witnesses, that I provoke my destiny, and acknowledge that I fall by a man of honour. Sir, said the colonel, with the piety of a confessor, wringing Mr. Lovelace's hand, snatch these few fleeting moments, and commend yourself to God. And so he rode off. The voiture proceeded slowly with my chevalier, yet the motion set both his wounds bleeding afresh, and it was with difficulty they again stopped the blood. We brought him alive to the nearest cottage, and he gave orders to me to dispatch to you the packet I herewith send sealed up and bid me write to you the particulars of this most unhappy affair, and give you thanks in his name for all your favours and friendship to him. Contrary to all expectation, he lived over the night, but suffered much, as well from his impatience and disappointment as from his wounds, for he seemed very unwilling to die. He was delirious at times, in the two last hours, and then several times cried out, as if he had seen some frightful spectre, Take her away! Take her away! But name nobody, and sometimes praise some lady, that Clarissa, I suppose, whom he had invoked when he received his death's wound, calling her sweet excellence, divine creature, 
fair sufferer, and once he said, Look down, blessed spirit, look down, and there stopped, his lips however moving. At nine in the morning he was seized with convulsions and fainted away, and it was a quarter of an hour before he came out of them. His few last words I must not omit, as they show an ultimate composure, which may administer some consolation to his honourable friends. Blessed, said he, addressing himself no doubt to heaven, for his dying eyes were lifted up. A strong convulsion prevented him for a few moments saying more, but recovering he again with great fervour, lifting up his eyes and his spread hands, pronounced the word blessed. Then in a seeming ejaculation he spoke inwardly, so as not to be understood. At last he distinctly pronounced these three words, Let this expiate. And then, his head sinking on his pillow, he expired, at about half an hour after ten. He little thought, poor gentleman, his end so near, so had given no direction about his body. I have caused it to be embowelled and deposited in a vault, till I have orders from England. This is a favour that was procured with difficulty, and would have been refused, had he not been an Englishman of rank a nation with reason respected in every Austrian government, for he had refused ghostly attendance and the sacraments in the Catholic way. May his soul be happy, I pray God. I have had some trouble also on account of the manner of his death from the magistracy here, who have taken the requisite informations in the affair, and it has cost some money, of which, and of the dear Chevalier's effects, I will give you a faithful account in my next. And so, waiting at this place, your commands, I am, sir, your most faithful and obedient servant, F. J. de la Tour. End of letter 63. Conclusion, part one of Clarissa Harlowe, or the History of a Young Lady, volume nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Clarissa Harlowe, or the History of a Young Lady, volume nine, by Samuel Richardson. Conclusion, part one supposed to be written by Mr. Belford. What remains to be mentioned for the satisfaction of such of the readers as may be presumed to have interested themselves in the fortunes of those other principals in the story who survived Mr. Lovelace, will be found summarily related as follows. The news of Mr. Lovelace's unhappy end was received with as much grief by his own relations as it was with exultation by the Harlow family and by Miss Howe. His own family were most to be pitied, because, being sincere admirers of the inimitable lady, they were greatly grieved for the injustice done her, and now had the additional mortification of losing the only male of it by a violent death. That his fate was deserved was still a heightening of their calamity, as they had for that very reason, and his unpreparedness for it, but too much ground for apprehension with regard to his future happiness. While the other family, from their unforgiving spirit, and even the noble young lady above mentioned from her lively resentments, found his death some little, some temporary alleviation of the heavy loss they had sustained, principally through his means. Temporary alleviation, we repeat, as to the Harlow family, for they were far from being happy or easy in their reflections upon their own conduct, and still the less as the inconsolable mother rested not till she had procured, by means of Colonel Morden, large extracts from some of the letters that composed this history, which convinced them all that the very correspondence which Clarissa, while with them, renewed with Mr. Lovelace, was renewed for their sakes, more than for her own, that she had given him no encouragement contrary to her duty, and to that prudence for which she was so early noted, that had they trusted to a discretion which they owned she had never brought into question, she would have extricated them and herself, as she once proposed to her mother, from all difficulties as to Lovelace, that she, if any woman ever could, would have given a glorious instance of a passion conquered, or at least kept under, by reason and by piety, the man being too immoral to be implicitly beloved. The unhappy parents and uncles, from the perusal of these extracts, too evidently for their peace, saw that it was entirely owing to the avarice, the ambition, the envy of her implacable brother and sister, and to the senseless confederacy entered into by the whole family, to compel her to give her hand to a man she must despise, or she had not been a Clarissa, and to their consequent persecution of her, that she ever thought of quitting her father's house, and that even when she first entertained such a thought, it was with intent, if possible, to procure for herself a private asylum with Mrs. Howe, or at some other place of safety but not with Mr. Lovelace, nor with any of the ladies of his family, though invited by the latter, from when she might propose terms which ought to have been complied with, and which were entirely consistent with her duty, that though she found herself disappointed of the hoped for refuge and protection, she intended not by meeting Mr. Lovelace to put herself into his power, all that she aimed at by taking that step being to endeavour to pacify so fierce a spirit, lest he should, as he indeed was determined to do, 
pay a visit to her friends, which might have been attended with fatal consequences, but was spirited away by him in such a manner as made her an object of pity rather than of blame. These extracts further convince them all that it was to her unaffected regret that she found that marriage was not in her power afterwards for a long time, and at last but on one occasion, when their unnatural cruelty to her, on a new application she had made to her aunt Harvey, to procure mercy and pardon, rendered her incapable of receiving his proffered hand, and so obliged her to suspend the day, intending only to suspend it till recovered. They saw with equal abhorrence of Lovelace and of their own cruelty, and with the highest admiration of her, that the majesty of her virtue had awed the most daring spirit in the world, so that he durst not attempt to carry his base designs into execution till, by wicked potions, he had made her senses the previous sacrifice. But how did they in a manner adore her memory? How did they recriminate upon each other? when they found that she had not only preserved herself from repeated outrage by the most glorious and intrepid behaviour in defiance and to the utter confusion of all his libertine notions but had the fortitude constantly and with a noble disdain to reject him whom why the man she once could have loved kneeling for pardon and begging to be permitted to make her the best reparation then in his power to make her that is to say by marriage his fortunes high and unbroken she his prisoner at the time in a vile house rejected by all her friends upon repeated application to them for mercy and forgiveness rejected mercy and forgiveness and a last blessing afterwards imploring and that as much to lighten their future remorses as for the comfort of her own pious heart yet they savagely refused on a supposition that she was not so near her end as she was represented departed forgiving and blessing them all then they recollected that her posthumous letters instead of reproaches were filled with comfortings that she had in her last will in their own way laid obligations upon them all obligations which they neither deserved nor expected, as if she thought to repair the injustice which self-partiality made some of them conclude done to them by her grandfather in his will. These intelligences and recollections were perpetual subjects of recrimination to them, heightened their anguish for the loss of a child who was the glory of their family, and not seldom made them shun each other, at the times they were accustomed to meet together, that they might avoid the mutual reproaches of eyes that spoke when tongues were silent, their stings also sharpened by time what an unhappy family was this well my colonel morden in the words of juvenal challenge all other miserable families to produce such a growing distress as that of the harlows a few months before so happy was able to produce humani generis mores tibi nosse volenti suffice una domus paucos consume dies et dicere te miserum postquam ilinc veneris aude mrs harlow lived about two years and an half after the lamented death of her clarissa Mr. Harlow had the additional affliction to survive his lady about half a year, her death by new pointing his former anguish and remorse, hastening his own. Both in their last hours, however, comforted themselves that they should be restored to their blessed daughter, as they always, from the time they were acquainted with the above particulars of her story, and with her happy exit, called her. They both lived, however, to see their son James and their daughter Arabella married, but not to take joy in either of their nuptials. Mr. James Harlow married a woman of family, an orphan, and is obliged at a very great expense to support his claim to estates which were his principal inducement to make his addresses to her, but which to this day he has not recovered, nor is likely to recover, having powerful adversaries to contend with, and a title to assert which admits of litigation, and he not blessed with so much patience as is necessary to persons embarrassed in law. What is further observable with regard to him is, that the match was entirely of his own head, against the advice of his father, mother, and uncles, who warned him of marrying in this lady a lawsuit for life. His ungenerous behaviour to his wife, for what she cannot help, and for what is as much her misfortune as his, has occasioned such estrangements between them, she being a woman of spirit, as, were the lawsuits determined even more favourably than probably they will be, must make him unhappy to the end of his life. He attributes all his misfortunes, when he opens himself to the few friends he has, to his vile and cruel treatment of his angelic sister. He confesses these misfortunes to be just, without having temper to acquiesce in the acknowledged justice. One month in every year he puts on mourning, and that month commences with him on the 7th of September, during which he shuts himself up from all company. Finally he is looked upon, and often calls himself, the most miserable of beings. Arabella's fortune became a temptation to a man of quality to make his addresses to her, his title and inducement with her to approve of him. Brothers and sisters, when they are not friends, are generally the sharpest enemies to each other. He thought too much was done for in the settlements. She thought not enough, and for some years past they have so heartily hated each other that if either know a joy it is in being told of some new misfortune or displeasure that happens to the other. Indeed, before they came to an open rupture, 
they were continually loading each other by way of exonerating themselves to the additional disquiet of the whole family with the principal guilt of their implacable behaviour and sordid cruelty to their admirable sister may the reports that are spread of this lady's further unhappiness from her lord's free life a fault she justly thought so odious in mr lovelace though that would not have been an insuperable objection with her to his addresses and of his public slights and contempt of her and even sometimes of his personal abuses which are said to be owing to her impatient spirit and violent passions be utterly groundless for what a heart must that be which would wish she might be as great a torment to herself as she had aimed to be to her sister especially as she regrets to this hour and declares that she shall to the last of her life her cruel treatment of that sister and as well as her brother is but too ready to attribute to that her own unhappiness mr antony and mr john harlowe are still at the writing of this living but often declare that with their beloved niece they lost all the joy of their lives and lament without reserve in all companies the unnatural part they were induced to take against her mr solmes is also still living if a man of his cast may be said to live for his general behaviour and sordid manners are such as justify the aversion the excellent lady had to him he has moreover found his addresses rejected by several women of far inferior fortunes great as his own are to those of the lady to whom he was encouraged to aspire mr mowbray and mr tourville having lost the man in whose conversation they so much delighted shocked and awakened by the several unhappy catastrophes before their eyes and having always rather ductile in dictating hearts took their friend belford's advice converted the remainder of their fortunes into annuities for life and retired the one into yorkshire the other into nottinghamshire of which counties they are natives their friend belford managing their concerns for them and corresponding with them and having more and more hopes every time he sees them which is once or twice a year when they come to town that they will become more and more worthy of their names and families as those sisters in iniquity sally martin and polly horton had abilities and education superior to what creatures of their caste generally can boast of and as their histories are nowhere given in the preceding papers in which they are frequently mentioned it cannot fail of gratifying the reader's curiosity as well as answering the good ends designed by the publication of this work to give a brief account of their parentage and manner of training up preparative to the vile courses they fell into and of what became of them after the dreadful exit of the infamous sinclair sally martin was the daughter of a substantial mercer at the court end of the town to whom her mother a grocer's daughter in the city brought her handsome fortune and both having a gay turn and being fond of the fashions which it was their business to promote and which the wives and daughters of the uppermost tradesmen especially in that quarter of the town generally affect to follow it was no wonder that they brought up their daughter accordingly nor that she who was a very sprightly and ready-witted girl and reckoned very pretty and very genteel should every year improve upon such examples she early found herself mistress of herself all she did was right all she said was admired early very early did she dismiss blushes from her cheek she could not blush because she could not doubt and silence whatever was the subject was as much a stranger to her as diffidence she never was left out of any party of pleasure after she had passed her ninth year and in honour of her prattling vein was considered as a principal person in the frequent treats and entertainments which her parents fond of luxurious living gave with a view to increase their acquaintance for the sake of their business not duly reflecting that the part they suffered her to take in what made for their interest would probably be a mean to quicken their appetites and ruin the morals of their daughter for whose sake as an only child they were solicitous to obtain wealth the child so much a woman what must the woman be at fifteen or sixteen she affected both in dress and manners to ape such of the quality as were most apish the richest silks in her father's shop were not too rich for her at all public diversions she was the leader instead of the lead of all her female kindred and acquaintances though they were a third older than herself she would bustle herself into a place and make room for her more bashful companions through the frowns of the first possessors at a crowded theatre leaving every one near her amazed at her self-consequence wondering she had no servant to keep place for her whisperingly inquiring who she was and then sitting down admiring her fortitude she officiously made herself of consequence to the most noted players who as one of their patronesses applied to her for her interest on their benefit nights she knew the christian as well as surname of every pretty fellow who frequented public places and affected to speak of them by the former those who had not obeyed the call her eyes always made upon all of them for notice at her entrance or before she took her seat were spoken of with haughtiness as jacks or toms while her favourites with an affectedly endearing familiarity and a prettiness of accent were jackies and tommies and if they stood very high in her graces dear devils and agreeable toads she sat in judgment and an inexorable judge she was upon the actions and conduct of every man and woman of quality and fashion as they became the subjects of conversation she was deeply learned in the scandalous chronicle 
she made every character, every praise, and every censure serve to exalt herself. She should scorn to do so or so, or that was ever her way, and just what she did or liked to do, and judging herself by the vileness of the most vile of her sex, she wiped her mouth and sat down satisfied with her own virtue. She had her chair to attend her wherever she went, and found people among her betters, as her pride stooped to call some of the most insignificant people in the world, to encourage her visits. She was practised in all the arts of the card-table, a true Spartan girl, and had even courage, occasionally, to wrangle off her detection. Late hours, turning night into day and day into night, were the almost unavoidable consequences of her frequent play. Her parents pleased themselves that their Sally had a charming constitution, and as long as she suffered not in her health, they were regardless of her morals. The needle she hated, and made the constant subjects of her ridicule, the fine works that used to employ and keep out of idleness, luxury, and extravagance, and at home, were they to have been of no other service, the women of the last age, when there were no Vauxhalls, Rainleys, Marbones, and such like places of diversion, to dress out for and gad after. And as to family management, her parents had not required any knowledge of that sort from her, and she considered it as a qualification only necessary for hirelings and the low-born, and as utterly unworthy of the attention of a modern fine lady. Although her father had great business, yet, living in so high and expensive a way, he pretended not to give her a fortune answerable to it. Neither he nor his wife, having set out with any notion of frugality, could think of retrenching, nor did their daughter desire that they should retrench. They thought glare or ostentation reputable, they called it living genteelly, and as they lifted their heads above their neighbours, they supposed their credit concerned to go forward rather than backward in outward appearances. They flattered themselves, and they flattered their girl, and she was entirely of their opinion, that she had charms and wit enough to attract some man of rank, or fortune at least, and yet this daughter of a mercer father and grosser mother could not bear the thoughts of a creeping sit, and encouraging herself with a few instances, common ones, of girls much inferior to herself in station, talents, education, and even fortune, who had succeeded, as she doubted not to succeed. Handsome settlements and a chariot, that tempting gewgaw to the vanity of the middling class of females, were the least that she proposed to herself. But all this while neither her parents nor herself considered that she had appetites indulged to struggle with, and a turn of education given her, as well as a warm constitution, unguarded by sound principles, and unbenefited by example, which made her much better qualified for a mistress than a wife. Her twentieth year, to her own equal wonder and regret, passed over her head, and she had not one offer that her pride would permit her to accept of. A girl from fifteen to eighteen, her beauty then beginning to blossom, will, as a new thing, attract the eyes of men. But if she make her face cheap at public places, she will find that new faces will draw more attention than fine faces constantly seen. Policy, therefore, if nothing else were considered, would induce a young beauty if she could tame her vanity, just to show herself and to be talked of, and then withdrawing as if from discretion, and discreet it will be to do so, expect to be sought after, rather than to be thought to seek for, only reviving now and then the memory of herself at the public places in turn, if she find herself likely to be forgotten, and then she will be new again. But this observation ought young ladies always to have in their heads, that they can hardly ever expect to gratify their vanity, and at the same time gain the admiration of men worthy of making partners for life. They may, in short, have many admirers at public places, but not one lover. Sally Martin knew nothing of this doctrine. Her beauty was in its bloom, and yet she found herself neglected. Sally Martin, the mercer's daughter. She never fails being here, was the answer, and the accompanying observation made to every questioner. Who is that lady? At last her destiny approached. It was at a masquerade that she first saw the gay, the handsome Lovelace, who was just returned from his travels. She was immediately struck with his figure, and with the brilliant things that she heard fall from his lips, as he happened to sit near her. He, who was not then looking out for a wife, was taken with Sally's smartness, and with an air that at the same time showed her to be equally genteel and self-significant, and signs of approbation mutually passing, he found no difficulty in acquainting himself where to visit her next day. And yet it was some mortification to a person of her self-consequence and gay appearance, to submit to be known by so fine a young gentleman as no more than a mercer's daughter." so natural is it for a girl brought up as sally was to be occasionally ashamed of those whose folly had set her above herself but whatever it might be to sally it was no disappointment to mr lovelace to find his mistress of no higher degree because he hoped to reduce her soon to the lowest condition that an unhappy woman can fall into but when miss martin had informed herself that her lover was the nephew and presumptive heir of lord m she thought him the very man for whom she had been so long and so impatiently looking out and for whom it was worth her while to spread her toils and here it may not be amiss to observe that it is very probable that mr lovelace had sally martin in his thoughts and perhaps two or three more 
whose hopes of marriage from him had led them to their ruin, when he drew the following whimsical picture, in a letter to his friend Belford, not inserted in the preceding collection. Methinks, says he, I see a young couple in courtship, having each a design upon the other. The girl plays off. She is very happy as she is. She cannot be happier. She will not change her single state. The man, I will suppose, is one who does not confess that he desires not that she should. She holds ready a net under her apron, he another under his coat, each intending to throw it over the other's neck, she over his, when her pride is gratified, and she thinks she can be sure of him, he over hers, when the watch for a yielding moment has carried consent too far. And suppose he happens to be the more dexterous of the two, and whips his net over her, before she can cast hers over him. How, I would fain know, can she be justly entitled to cry out upon cruelty, barbarity, deception, sacrifices, and all the rest of the exclamatory nonsense with which the pretty fools in such a case are wont to din the ears of their conquerors? Is it not just, thinkest thou, when she makes her appeal to gods and men, that both gods and men should laugh at her, and hitting her in the teeth with her own felonious intentions, bid her sit down patiently under her deserved disappointment? In short, Sally's parents, as well as herself, encouraged Mr. Lovelace's visits, they thought they might trust to a discretion in her which she herself was too wise to doubt pride they knew she had and that in these cases is often called discretion lord help the sex says lovelace if they had not pride nor did they suspect danger from that specious air of sincerity and gentleness of manners which he could assume or lay aside whenever he pleased the second masquerade which was no more than their third meeting abroad completed her ruin from so practised though so young a deceiver and that before she well knew she was in danger for having prevailed on her to go off with him about twelve o'clock to his aunt Forbes's, a lady of honour and fortune, to whom he had given reason to expect her future niece, the only hint of marriage he ever gave her, he carried her off to the house of the wicked woman who bears the name of Sinclair in these papers, and there by promises which she understood in the favourable sense, for where woman loves she seldom doubts enough for her safety, obtained an easy conquest over a virtue that was little more than nominal. He found it not difficult to induce her to proceed in the guilty commerce, till the effects of it became too apparent to be hid. Her parents then, in the first fear of their disappointment, and vexation for being deprived of all hopes of such a son-in-law, turned out of doors. Her disgrace thus published she became hardened, and protected by her seducer, whose favourite mistress she then was. She was so incensed against her parents, for an indignity so little suiting with her pride, and the head they had always given her, that she refused to return to them when, repenting of their passionate treatment of her, they would have been reconciled to her and becoming the favourite daughter of her mother sinclair at the persuasions of that abandoned woman she practised to bring on an abortion which she effected though she was so far gone that it had liked to have cost her her life thus unchastity her first crime murder her next her conscience became seared and young as she was and fond of her deceiver soon grew indelicate enough having so thorough paced a schoolmistress to do all she could to promote the pleasures of the man who had ruined her scrupling not with a spirit truly diabolical to endeavour to draw in others to follow her example and it is hardly to be believed what mischiefs of this sort she was the means of effecting, woman confiding in, and daring woman, and she a creature of specious appearance, and great art. A still viler wickedness, if possible, remains to be said of Sally Martin. Her father dying, her mother, in hopes to reclaim her, as she called it, proposed her to quit the house of the infamous Sinclair, and to retire with her into the country, where her disgrace and her then wicked way of life would not be known, and there so to live as to save appearances, the only virtue she had ever taught her, besides that of endeavouring rather to delude than be deluded. To this Sally consented, but with no other intention, as she often owned, and gloried in it, than to cheat her mother of the greatest part of her substance, in revenge for consenting to her being turned out of doors long before, and by way of reprisal, for having persuaded her father, as she would have it, to cut her off in his last will from any share in his fortune. This unnatural wickedness in half a year's time she brought about, and then the serpent retired to her obscene den with her spoils, laughing at what she had done, even after it had broken her mother's heart as it did in a few months' time, a severe but just punishment for the unprincipled education she had given her. It ought to be added that this was an iniquity of which neither Mr. Lovelace nor any of his friends could bear to hear her boast, and always checked her for it whenever she did, condemning it with one voice. And it is certain that this and other instances of her complicated wickedness turned early Lovelace's heart against her, and had she not been subservient to him in his other pursuits, he would not have endured her, for speaking of her he would say, let not any one reproach us, Jack. There is no wickedness like the wickedness of a woman. A bad education was the preparative, it must be confessed, and for this Sally Martin had reason to thank her parents, as they had reason to thank themselves for what followed. But had she not met with a loveless, she had avoided a Sinclair, and might have gone on at the common rate of wives so educated, and been the mother of children turned out to take their chance in the world as she was, so many lumps of soft wax, 
fit to take any impression that the first accidents gave them, neither happy nor making happy, everything but useful and well off, if not extremely miserable. Polly Horton was the daughter of a gentlewoman, well descended, whose husband, a man of family and of honour, was a captain in the guards. He died when Polly was about nine years of age, leaving her to the care of her mother, a lively young lady of about twenty-six, with a genteel provision for both. Her mother was extremely fond of her Polly, but had it not in herself to manifest the true, the genuine fondness of a parent, by a strict and guarded education, dressing out and visiting, and being visited by the gay of her own sex, and casting her eye abroad, as one very ready to try her fortune again in the married state. This induced those airs and a love to those diversions, which make a young widow of so lively a turn, the unfittest tutoress in the world, even to her own daughter. Mrs. Horton herself, having had an early turn to music, and that sort of reading which is but an earlier debauchery for young minds, preparative to the grosser at riper years, to wit, romances and novels, songs and plays, and those without distinction, moral or immoral, she indulged her daughter in the same taste, and at those hours, when they could not take part in the more active and lively amusements and kill-times, as some call them, used to employ Miss to read to her, happy enough in her own imagination, that while she was diverting her own years, and sometimes, as the piece was, corrupting her own heart and her child's too, she was teaching Miss to read and improve her mind, for it was the boast of every tea-table half-hour, that Miss Horton, in propriety, accent, and emphasis, surpassed all the young ladies her age, and at other times, complimenting the pleased mother, "'Bless me, madam, with what a surprising grace Miss Horton reads! She enters into the very spirit of her subject. This she could have from nobody but you. An intended praise, but as the subjects were, would have been a severe satire in the mouth of an enemy, while the fond, the inconsiderate mother, with a delighted air, would cry, "'Why, I cannot but say Miss Horton does credit to her tutoress, and then a, "'Come hither, my best love!' and with a kiss of approbation, "'What a pleasure to your dear papa! Had he lived to see your improvements, my charmer!' concluding with a sigh of satisfaction, her eyes turning round upon the circle, to take in all the silent applauses of theirs. But little thought the fond, the foolish mother, what the plant would be which was springing up from these seeds. Little imagined she that her own ruin as well as her child's was to be the consequence of this fine education, and that in the same ill-fated hour the honour of both mother and daughter was to become a sacrifice to the intriguing invader. This, the laughing girl, when abandoned to her evil destiny, and in company with her sister Sally and others, each recounting their settings out, their progress and their fall, frequently related to be her education and manner of training up. This, and to see a succession of humble servants buzzing about a mother, who took too much pride in her dresses of that kind, what a beginning, what an example, to a constitution of tinder so prepared to receive the spark struck from the steely forehead and flinty heart of such a libertine as at last it was their fortune to be encountered by. In short, as Miss grew up under the influences of such a directress, and a book so light and frothy, with the inflaming additions of music, concerts, operas, plays, assemblies, balls, and the rest of the rabble of amusements of modern life, it is no wonder that, like early fruit, she was soon ripened to the hand of the insidious gatherer. At fifteen she owned she was ready to fancy herself the heroine of every novel and of every comedy she read, so well did she enter into the spirit of her subject. She glowed to become the object of some hero's flame, and perfectly longed to begin an intrigue, and even to be run away with by some enterprising lover yet had neither confinement nor check to apprehend from her indiscreet mother, which she thought absolutely necessary to constitute a Parthenisa. Nevertheless, with all these fine modern qualities, did she complete her nineteenth year, before she met with any address of consequence, one half of her admirers being afraid, because of her gay turn and but middling fortune, to make serious applications for her favour, while others were kept at a distance by the superior air she assumed, and a third sort, not sufficiently penetrating the foibles either of mother or daughter, were kept off by the supposed watchful care of the former. But when the man of intrepidity and intrigue was found, never was heroine so soon subdued, never goddess so easily stripped of her celestials. For at the opera, a diversion at which neither she nor her mother ever missed to be present, she beheld the specious loveless, beheld him invested with all the airs of heroic insult, resenting a slight affront offered to his Sally Martin, by two gentlemen who had known her in her more hopeful state, one of whom Mr. Lovelace obliged to sneak away with a broken head, given with the pommel of his sword, the other with a bloody nose, neither of them well supporting that readiness of offence which it seems was a part of their known character to be guilty of. The gallantry of this action drawing every bystand on the side of the hero, "'Oh, the brave man!' cried Polly Horton aloud to her mother, in a kind of rapture. "'How needful the protection of the brave to the fair!' with a softness in her voice which she had taught herself to suit her fancied high condition of life. A speech so much in his favour could not but take the notice of a man, 
who was but too sensible of the advantages which his fine person and noble air gave him over the gentler hearts who was always watching every female eye and who had his ear continually turned to every affected voice for that was one of his indications of a proper subject to be attempted affectation of every sort he used to say is a certain sign of a wrong-turned head of a faulty judgment and upon such a basis i seldom build in vain he instantly resolved to be acquainted with a young creature who seemed so strongly prejudiced in his favour never man had a ready invention for all sorts of mischief he gave his sally her cue he called her sister in their hearing and sally whisperingly gave the young lady and her mother in her own way the particulars of the affront she had received making herself an angel of light to cast a bright array upon the character of her heroic brother she particularly praised his known and approved courage and mingled with her praises of him such circumstances relating to his birth his fortune and endowments as left him nothing to do but to fall in love with the enamoured polly mr lovelace presently saw what turn to give his professions so brave a man yet of manners so gentle hit the young lady's taste nor could she suspect the heart that such an aspect covered this was the man the very man she whispered to her mother and when the opera was over his servant procuring a coach he undertook with his specious sister to set them down at their own lodgings though situated a quite different way from his and there were they prevailed upon to alight and partake of a slight repast sally pressed them to return the favour to her at her aunt forbes's and hoped it would be before her brother went to his own seat they promised her and named their evening a splendid entertainment was provided the guest came having in the interim found all that was said of his name and family and fortune to be true persons of so little strictness in their own morals took it not into their heads to be very inquisitive after his music and dancing had their share in the entertainment these opened their hearts already half opened by love the aunt forbes and the lover's sister kept them open by their own example the hero sung vowed promised their gratitude was moved their delights were augmented their hopes increased their confidence was engaged all their appetites up in arms the rich wines cooperating beat quite off their guard and not thought enough remaining for so much as suspicion miss detached from her mother by sally soon fell a sacrifice to the successful intriguer the widow herself half intoxicated and raised as she was with artful mixtures and inflamed by love unexpectedly tended by one of the libertines his constant companions to whom an opportunity was contrived to be given to be alone with her and that closely followed by importunity fell into her daughter's error the consequences of which in length of time becoming apparent grief shame remorse seized her heart her own indiscretion not allowing her to arraign her daughters and she survived not her delivery leaving polly with child likewise who when delivered being too fond of the gay deluder to renounce his company even when she found herself deluded fell into a course of extravagance and dissoluteness ran through her fortune in a very little time and as an high preferment at last with sally was admitted a quarter partner with the detestable sinclair all that is necessary to add to the history of these unhappy women will be comprised in a very little compass after the death of the profligate sinclair they kept on the infamous trade with too much success till an accident happened in the house a gentleman of family killed in it in a fray contending with another for a new vamped face sally was accused of holding the gentleman's arm while his more favoured adversary ran him through the heart and then made off and she being tried for her life narrowly escaped this accident obliged them to break up housekeeping and not having been frugal enough of their ill-gotten gains lavishing upon one what they got by another they were compelled for subsistence sake to enter themselves as under managers at such another house as their own had been in which service soon after sally died of a fever and surfeit got by a debauch and the other about a month after by a violent cold occasioned through carelessness in a salivation happier scenes open for the remaining characters for it might be descending too low to mention the untimely ends of dorcas and of william mr lovelace's wicked servant and the pining and consumptive ones of betty barnes and joseph leman unmarried both and in less than a year after the happy death of their excellent young lady the good mrs norton passed the small remainder of her life as happily as she wished in her beloved foster-daughter's dairy-house as it used to be called as she wished we repeat for she had two strong aspirations after another life to be greatly attached to this she laid out the greatest part of her time in doing good by her advice and by the prudent management of the fund committed to her direction having lived an exemplary life from her youth upwards and seen her son happily settled in the world she departed with ease and calmness without pang or agony like a tired traveller falling into a sweet slumber her last words expressing her hope of being restored to the child of her bosom and to her own excellent father and mother to whose care and pain she owed that good education to which she was indebted for all her other blessings the poor's fund which was committed to her care she resigned a week before her death into the hands of mrs hickman according the direction of the will and all the accounts and disbursements with it 
which she had kept with such an exactness that the lady declares that she will follow her method and only wishes to discharge the trust as well miss howe was not to be persuaded to quit her mourning for her dear friend until six months were fully expired and then she made mr hickman one of the happiest men in the world a woman of her fine sense and understanding married to a man of virtue and good nature who had no past capital errors to reflect upon and to abate his joys and whose behaviour to mrs hickman is as affectionate as it was respectful to miss howe could not do otherwise they are already blessed with two fine children a daughter to whom by joint consent they have given the name of her beloved friend and a son who bears that of his father she has allotted to mr hickman who takes delight in doing good and that as much for its own sake as to oblige her his part of the management of the poor's fund to be accountable for it as she pleasantly says to her she has appropriated every thursday morning for her part of that management and takes so much delight in the task that she declares it to be one of the most agreeable of her amusements and the more agreeable as she teaches every one whom she benefits to bless the memory of her departed friend to whom she attributes the merit of all her own charities as well as the honour of those which she dispenses in pursuance of her will she has declared that this fund shall never fail while she lives she has even engaged her mother to contribute annually to it and mr hickman has appropriated twenty pounds a year to the same in consideration of which she allows him to recommend four objects yearly to partake of it allows is her style for she assumes the whole prerogative of dispensing this charity the only prerogative she does or has occasion to assume in every other case there is but one will between them and that is generally his or hers as either speaks first upon any subject be it what it will mrs hickman she sometimes as pleasantly as generously tells him must not quite forget that she was once miss howe because if he had not loved her as such and with all her foibles she had never been mrs hickman nevertheless she seriously on all occasions and that to others as well as to himself confesses that she owes him unreturnable obligations for his patience with her in her day and for his generous behaviour to her in his and still more the highly does she esteem and love him as she reflects upon his past kindness to her beloved friend and on that dear friend's good opinion of him nor is it less grateful to her that the worthy man joins most sincerely with her in all those respectful and affectionate recollections which make the memory of the departed precious to survivors mr belford was not so destitute of humanity and affection as to be unconcerned at the unhappy fate of his most intimate friend but when he reflects upon the untimely ends of several of his companions but just mentioned in the preceding history on the shocking despondency and death of his poor friend belton on the signal justice which overtook the wicked tomlinson on the dreadful exit of the infamous sinclair on the deep remorses of his more valued friend and on the other hand on the example set him by the most excellent of her sex and on her blessed preparation and happy departure and when he considers as he often does with awe and terror that his wicked habits were so rooted in his depraved heart that all these warnings and this lovely example seem to be but necessary to enable him to subdue them and to reform and that such awakening calls are hardly ever afforded to men of his caste or if they are but seldom attended the full vigour of constitution when he reflects upon all these things he adores the mercy which through these calls has snatched him as a brand out of the fire and thinks himself obliged to make it his endeavours to find out and to reform any of those who may have been endangered by his means as well as to repair to the utmost of his power any damage or mischiefs which he may have occasioned to others with regard to the trust with which he was honoured by the inimitable lady he had the pleasure of acquitting himself of it in a very few months to everybody's satisfaction even to that of the unhappy family who sent him their thanks on the occasion nor was he at delivering up his accounts contented without resigning the legacy bequeathed to him to the uses of the will so that the poor's fund as it is called is become a very considerable sum and will be a lasting bank for relief of objects who best deserve relief there was but one earthly blessing which remained for mr belford to wish for in order morally speaking to secure to him all his other blessings and that was the greatest of all worldly ones a virtuous and prudent wife so free a liver as he had been he did not think that he could be worthy of such a one till upon an impartial examination of himself he found the pleasure he had in his new resolution so great and his abhorrence of his former courses so sincere that he was the less apprehensive of a deviation upon this presumption having also kept in his mind some encouraging hints from mr lovelace and having been so happy as to have it in his power to oblige lord m and that whole noble family by some services grateful to them the request for which from his unhappy friend was brought over among other papers with the dead body by de la tour he besought that nobleman's leave to make his addresses to miss charlotte montague the eldest of his lordship's two nieces and making at the same time such proposals of settlements as were not objected to his lordship was pleased to use his powerful interest in his favour and his worthy niece having no engagement she had the goodness to honour mr belford with her hand and thereby made him as completely happy as a man can be 
who has enormities to reflect upon, which are out of his power to atone for, by reason of the death of some of the injured parties, and the irreclaimableness of others. Happy is the man who, in the time of health and strength, sees and reforms the error of his ways. But how much more happy is he who has no capital in wilful errors to repent of? How unmixed and sincere must the joys of such a one come to him? Lord M. added bountifully in his lifetime, as did also the two ladies his sisters, to the fortune of their worthy niece. And as Mr. Belford had been blessed with a son by her, his lordship at his death, which happened just three years after the untimely one of his unhappy nephew, was pleased to devise to that son and to his descendants for ever, and in case of his death unmarried, to any other children of his niece, his Hertfordshire estate designed for Mr. Lovelace, which he made up to the value of a moiety of his real estates, bequeathing also a moiety of his personal to the same lady. Miss Patty Montague, a fine young lady, to whom her noble uncle at his death devised the other moiety of his real and personal estates, including his seat in Berkshire, lives at present with her excellent sister, Mrs. Belford, to whom she removed upon Lord M.'s death, but in all probability will soon be the lady of a worthy baronet, of ancient family, fine qualities, and ample fortunes, just returned from his travels, with a character superior to the very good one he set out with, a case that very seldom happens, although the end of travel is improvement. Colonel Morden, who with so many virtues and accomplishments cannot be unhappy, in several letters to the executor, with whom he corresponds from Florence, having since his unhappy affair with Mr. Lovelace changed his purpose of coming so soon to reside in England as he had intended, declares, that although he thought himself obliged either to accept of what he took to be a challenge as such, or tamely to acknowledge, that he gave up all resentment of his cousin's wrongs, and in a manner to beg pardon for having spoken freely of Mr. Lovelace behind his back, and although at the time he owns he was not sorry to be called upon, as he was, to take either the one course or the other, yet now, coolly reflecting upon his beloved cousin's reasonings against duelling, and upon the price it had too probably cost the unhappy man, he wishes he had more fully considered those words in his cousin's posthumous letter, if God will allow him time for repentance, why should you deny it him? Several worthy persons have wished that the heinous practice of duelling had been more forcibly discouraged by way of note, at the conclusion of a work designed to recommend the highest and most important doctrines of Christianity. It is humbly presumed that these persons have not sufficiently attended to what is already done on that subject in volume 2, letter 12, and in this volume, letter 16, 43, 44, and 45. To conclude, the worthy widow Lovick continues to live with Mr. Belford, and by her prudent behaviour, piety, and usefulness, has endeared herself to her lady and to the whole family. End of conclusion, part one. Conclusion, part two of Clarissa Harlowe or the History of a Young Lady, volume nine. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee, Clarissa Harlowe or the History of a Young Lady, Volume 9, by Samuel Richardson. Conclusion, Part 2. Postscript referred to in the preface, in which several objections that have been made as well to the catastrophe as to different parts of the preceding history are briefly considered. The foregoing work having been published at three different periods of time, the author in the course of its publication was favoured with many anonymous letters, in which the writers differently expressed their wishes with regard to the apprehended catastrophe. Most of those directed to him by the gentler sex turned in favour of what they called a fortunate ending. Some of the fair writers, enamoured, as they declared, with the character of the heroine, were warmly solicitous to have her made happy, and others, likewise of their mind, insisted that poetical justice required that it should be so. And when, says one ingenious lady, whose undoubted motive was good nature and humanity, it must be concluded that it is in an author's power to make his piece end as he pleases, why should he not give pleasure rather than pain to the reader whom he has interested in favour of his principal characters? Others, and some gentlemen, declared against tragedies in general, and in favour of comedies, almost in the words of Lovelace, who were supported in his taste by all the women at Mrs. Sinclair's, and by Sinclair herself. I have too much feeling, said he. There is enough in the world to make our hearts sad, without carrying grief into our diversions, and making the distresses of others our own. And how was this happy ending to be brought about? Why, by this very easy and trite expedient, to wit, by reforming Lovelace, and marrying him to Clarissa, not, however, abating her one of her trials, nor any of her sufferings, for the sake of the sport her distresses would give to the tender-hearted reader as she went along, the last outrage excepted, that, indeed partly in compliment to Lovelace himself, and partly for her delicacy's sake, they were willing to spare her. But whatever were the fate of his work, the author was resolved to take a different method. 
He always thought that sudden conversion, such especially as were left to the candour of the reader to suppose and make out, has neither art nor nature nor even probability in them, and that they were moreover of a very bad example. To have a loveless for a series of years glory in his wickedness, and think that he had nothing to do but as an act of grace and favour to hold out his hand to receive that of the best of women whenever he pleased, and to have it thought that marriage would be a sufficient amends for all his enormities to others as well as to her, he could not bear that. Nor is reformation, as he has shown in another piece, to be secured by a fine face, by a passion that has sense for its object, nor by the goodness of a wife's heart, nor even example, if the heart of the husband be not graciously touched by the divine finger. It will be seen by this time that the author had a great end in view. He had lived to see the scepticism and infidelity openly avowed, and even endeavoured to be propagated from the press, the greatest doctrines of the gospel brought into question, those of self-denial and mortification blotted out of the catalogue of Christian virtues, and a taste even to wantonness for outdoor pleasure and luxury, to the general exclusion of domestic as well as public virtue, industriously promoted among all ranks and degrees of people. In this general depravity, when even the pulpit has lost great part of its weight, and the clergy are considered as a body of interested men, the author thought he should be able to answer it to his own heart, be the success what it would, if he threw in his might towards introducing a reformation so much wanted, and he imagined that, if in an age given up to diversion and entertainment, if he could steal in, as may be said, and investigate the great doctrines of Christianity under the fashionable guise of an amusement, he should be most likely to serve his purpose, remembering that of the poet. A verse may find him who a sermon flies, and turn delight into a sacrifice. He was resolved, therefore, to attempt something that never yet had been done. He considered that the tragic poets have as seldom made their heroes true objects of pity, as the comics theirs laudable ones of imitation, and still more rarely have made them in their deaths look forward to a future hope. And thus when they die they seem totally to perish. Death in such instances must appear terrible. It must be considered as the greatest evil. But why is death set in such shocking lights when it is the universal lot? He has indeed thought fit to paint the death of the wicked as terrible as he could paint it but he has endeavoured to draw that of the good in such an amiable manner, that the very alarms of the world should not forbear to wish that their latter end might be like that of the heroine. And after all, what is the poetical justice so much contended for by some, as the generality of writers have managed it, but another sort of dispensation than that with which God by revelation teaches us, he has thought fit to exercise mankind, whom placing here only in a state of probation, he hath so intermingled good and evil, as to necessitate us to look forward for a more equal dispensation of both. The author of the history, or rather dramatic narrative, of Clarissa, is therefore well justified by the Christian system, in deferring to extricate suffering virtue to the time in which it will meet with the completion of its reward, but not absolutely to shelter the conduct observed in it under the sanction of religion, an authority perhaps not of the greatest weight with some of our modern critics. It must be observed that the author is justified in its catastrophe by the greatest master of reason and best judge of composition that ever lived. The learned reader knows we must mean Aristotle, whose sentiments in this matter we shall beg leave to deliver, in the words of a very amiable writer of our own country. The English writers of tragedy, says Mr. Addison, are possessed with a notion that when they represent a virtuous or innocent person in distress, they ought not to leave him till they have delivered him out of his troubles, or made him triumph over his enemies. This error they have been led into by a ridiculous doctrine in modern criticism, that they are obliged to an equal distribution of rewards and punishments, and an impartial execution of poetical justice. Who were the first that established this rule, I know not, but I am sure it has no foundation in nature, in reason, or in the practice of the ancients. We find that good and evil happen alike unto all men on this side the grave, and as the principal design of tragedy is to raise commiseration and terror in the minds of the audience, we shall defeat this great end, if we always make virtue and innocence happy and successful. Whatever crosses and disappoints a good man suffers in the body of the tragedy, they will make but small impression on our minds, when we know that in the last act he is to arrive at the end of his wishes and desires. When we see him engaged in the depth of his afflictions, we are apt to comfort ourselves, because we are sure he will find his way out of them, and that his grief, however great server it may be at present, will soon terminate in gladness. For this reason, the ancient writers of tragedy treated men in their plays, as they are dealt with in the world, by making virtue sometimes happy and sometimes miserable, as they found it in the fable which they made choice of, or as it might affect their audience in the most agreeable manner. Aristotle considers the tragedies that were written in either of those kinds, and observes that those which ended unhappily had always pleased the people, and carried away the prize, in the public disputes of the state, from those that ended happily. 
Terror and commiseration leave a pleasing anguish in the mind, and fix the audience in such a serious composure of thought, as is much more lasting and delightful than any little transient starts of joy and satisfaction. Accordingly we find that more of our English tragedies have succeeded, in which the favourites of the audience sink under their calamities, than those in which they recover themselves out of them. The best plays of this kind are The Orphan, Venice Preserved, Alexander the Great, Theodosius, All for Love, Oedipus, Orinoco, Othello, etc. King Lear is an admirable tragedy of the same kind, as Shakespeare wrote it, but as it is reformed according to the chimerical notion of poetical justice, in my humble opinion it has lost half its beauty. At the same time I must allow that there are very noble tragedies which have been framed upon the other plan and have ended happily, as indeed most of the good tragedies which have been written since the starting of the above-mentioned criticism have taken this turn. The Morning Bride, Tamerlane, Ulysses, Phaedra and Hippolytus, with most of Mr. Dryden's, I must also allow that many of Shakespeare's and several of the celebrated tragedies of antiquity are cast in the same form. I do not therefore dispute against this way of writing tragedies, but against the criticism that would establish this as the only method, and by that means would very much cramp the English tragedy, and perhaps give a wrong bent to the genius of our writers. This subject is further considered in a letter to the spectator. I find your opinion, says the author of it, concerning the late invented term called poetical justice, is controverted by some eminent critics. I have drawn up some additional arguments to strengthen the opinion which you have there delivered, having endeavoured to go to the bottom of that matter. The most perfect man has vices enough to draw down punishments upon his head, and to justify providence in regard to any miseries that may befall him. For this reason I cannot but think that the instruction and moral are much finer, where a man who is virtuous in the main of his character falls into distress, and sinks under the blows of fortune, at the end of a tragedy, than when he is represented as happy and triumphant. Such an example corrects the insolence of human nature, softens the mind of the beholder with sentiments of pity and compassion, comforts him under his own private affliction, and teaches him not to judge of men's virtues by their successes. I cannot think of one real hero in all antiquity, so far raised above human infirmities, that he might not be very naturally represented in a tragedy as plunged in misfortunes and calamities. The poet may still find out some prevailing passion or indiscretion in his character, and show it in such a manner as will sufficiently acquit providence of any injustice in his sufferings. For, as Horace observes, the best man is faulty, though not in so great a degree, as those whom we generally call vicious men. If such a strict poetical justice, proceeds the letter-writer, as some gentlemen insist upon, were to be observed in this art, there is no manner of reason why it should not be so little observed in Homer, that his Achilles is placed in the greatest point of glory and success, though his character is morally vicious and only poetically good, if I may use the phrase of our modern critics. The Aeneid is filled with innocent unhappy persons. Nisus and Euryalus, Lausus and Pallas, come all to unfortunate ends. The poet takes notice in particular that in the sacking of Troy, Ripheus fell, who was the most just character among the Trojans. Cadit et Ripheus, justissimus unus, qui fuit in teucris, et servantissimus aequi, dies aliter visum est. The gods thought fit, so blameless Ripheus fell, who loved fair justice, and observed it well. And that Pantheus could neither be preserved by his transcendent piety, nor by the holy fillets of Apollo, whose priest he was. Nec te tua plurima, Panteu, labentum pietas, nec Apollonis infula texit. Nor could thy piety thee, Pantheus, save, nor even thy priesthood from an early grave. I might here mention the practice of ancient tragic poets, both Greek and Latin, but as this particular is touched upon in the paper above mentioned, I shall pass it over in silence. I could produce passages out of Aristotle, in favour of my opinion, and if in one place he says, that an absolutely virtuous man should not be represented as unhappy, this does not justify any one who should think fit to bring in an absolutely virtuous man upon the stage. Those who are acquainted with that author's way of writing know very well, that to take the whole extent of his subject into his divisions of it, he often makes use of such cases as are imaginary, and not reducible to practice. I shall conclude, says this gentleman, with observing, that though the spectator above mentioned is so far against the rule of poetical justice as to affirm, that good men may meet with an unhappy catastrophe in tragedy, it does not say that ill men may go off unpunished. The reason for this distinction is very plain, namely, because the best of men, as is said above, have faults enough to justify providence for any misfortunes and afflictions which may befall them, but there are many men so criminal that they can have no claim or pretence to happiness. The best of men may deserve punishment, but the worst of men cannot deserve happiness. Mr. Addison, 
as we have seen above, tells us that Aristotle, in considering the tragedies that were written in either of the kinds, observes that those which ended unhappily had always pleased the people, and carried away the prize, in the public disputes of the stage, from those that ended happily. And we shall take leave to add, that this preference was given at a time when the entertainments of the stage were committed to the care of the magistrates, when the prizes contended for were given by the state, when, of consequence, the emulation among writers was ardent, and when learning was at the highest pitch of glory in that renowned commonwealth. It cannot be supposed that the Athenians, in this their highest age of taste and politeness, were less humane, less tender-hearted, than we of the present, but they were not afraid of being moved, nor ashamed of showing themselves to be so, at the distresses they saw well painted and represented. In short, they were of the opinion, with the wisest of men, that it was better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of mirth, and had fortitude enough to trust themselves with their own generous grief, because they found their hearts mended by it. Thus also Horace, and the politest Romans in the Augustan age, wished to be affected. Agne forte putes me, quae facere ipse recusum, cum recte tractant alii, laudere maligne, ille per extentum funem mihi posse videto, ire poeta, meum qui pectus in anita angit, irritat, mulcet, falsis terroribus implet, ut magis, et modo me thebis, modo poent Athenis, thus Englished by Mr. Pope. Yet, lest thou think I rally more than teach, or praise malignly arts I cannot reach, let me for once presume to instruct the times, to know the poet from the man of rhymes. Tis he who gives my breast a thousand pains, can make me feel each passion that he feigns, and rage compose with more than magic art, with pity and with terror tear my heart, and snatch me o'er the earth or through the air, to Thebes, to Athens, when he will, and where. Our fair readers are also desired to attend to what a celebrated critic of a neighbouring nation says on the nature and design of tragedy, from the rules laid down by the same great ancient, Rapin, on Aristotle's poetics. Tragedy, says he, makes man modest, by representing the great masters of the earth humbled, and it makes him tender and merciful, by showing him the strange accidents of life, and the unforeseen disgraces, to which the most important persons are subject. But because man is naturally timorous and compassionate, he may fall into other extremes. Too much fear may shake his constancy of mind, and too much of tragedy to regulate these two weaknesses. It prepares and arms him against disgraces by showing them so frequent in the most considerable persons, and he will cease to fear extraordinary accidents when he sees them happen to the highest part of mankind, and still more efficacious, we may add, the example will be when he sees them happen to the best. But as the end of tragedy is to teach men not to fear too weakly common misfortunes, it proposes also to teach them to spare their compassion for objects that deserve it, for there is an injustice in being moved at the afflictions of those who deserve to be miserable. We may see without pity Clytemnestra slain by her son Orestes in Aeschylus, because she had murdered Agamemnon, her husband. Yet we cannot see Hippolytus die by the plot of his stepmother Phaedra in Euripides without compassion, because he died not but for being chaste and virtuous. These are the great authorities so favourable to the stories that end unhappily, and we beg leave to reinforce this inference from them, that if the temporary sufferings of the virtuous and the good can be accounted for and justified on pagan principles, many more and infinitely stronger reasons will occur to a Christian reader in behalf of what are called unhappy catastrophes, from the consideration of the doctrine of future rewards, which is everywhere strongly enforced in the history of Clarissa. Of this, to give but one instance, an ingenious modern distinguished by his rank, but much more for his excellent defence of some of the most important doctrines of Christianity, appears convinced in the conclusion of a pathetic monody lately published, in which, after he had deplored as a man without hope, expressing ourselves in the scripture phrase, the loss of an excellent wife, he thus consoles himself. Yet, O my soul, thy rising murmurs stay, nor dare the all-wise disposer to arraign, or against his supreme decree, with impious grief complain, that all thy full-blown joys at once should fade, was his most righteous will, and be that will obeyed, would thy fond love his grace to her control, and in these low abodes of sin and pain, her pure exalted soul, unjustly for thy partial good detain? No, rather strive thy grovelling mind to raise, up to that unclouded blaze, that heavenly radiance of eternal light, in which enthroned she now with pity sees 
how frail how insecure how slight is every mortal bliss but of infinitely greater weight than all that has been above produced on this subject are the words of the psalmist as for me says he my feet were almost gone my steps had well nigh slipped for i was envious at the foolish when i saw the prosperity of the wicked for their strength is firm they are not in trouble as other men neither are they plagued like other men their eyes stand out with fatness they have more than their heart could wish verily i have cleansed mine heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence for all the day long have i been plagued and chastened every morning when i thought to know this it was too painful for me until i went into the sanctuary of god then understood i their end thou shalt guide me with thy counsel and afterwards receive me to glory this is the psalmist's comfort and dependence and shall man presuming to alter the common course of nature and so far as he is able to elude the tenure by which frail mortality indispensably holds imagine that he can make a better dispensation and by calling it poetical justice indirectly reflect on the divine the more pains have been taken to obviate the objections arising from the notion of poetical justice as the doctrine built upon it had obtained general credit among us and as it must be confessed to have the appearance of humanity and good nature for its supports and yet the writer of the history of clarissa is humbly of opinion that he might have been excused referring to them for the vindication of his catastrophe even by those who are advocates for the contrary opinion since the notion of poetical justice founded on the modern rules has hardly ever been more strictly observed in works of this nature than in the present performance for is not mr lovelace who could persevere in his villainous views against the strongest and most frequent convictions and remorses that ever were sent to awaken and reclaim a wicked man is not this great this wilful transgressor condignly punished and his punishment brought on through the intelligence of the very joseph leman whom he had corrupted and by means of the very woman whom he had debauched is not mr belton who had an uncle's hastened death to answer for are not the infamous sinclair and her wretched partners and even the wicked servants who with their eyes open contributed their parts to the carrying on of the vile schemes of their respective principles are they not all likewise exemplarily punished on the other hand is not miss howe for her noble friendship to the exalted lady in her calamities is not mr hickman for his unexceptionable morals and integrity of life is not the repentant and not ungenerous belford is not the worthy norton made signally happy and who that are in earnest in their professions of christianity but will rather envy than regret the triumphant death of clarissa whose piety from her early childhood whose diffusive charity whose steady virtue whose christian humility whose forgiving spirit whose meekness and resignation heaven only could reward and here it may not be amiss to remind the reader that so early in the work as volume two letter thirty eight the dispensations of providence are justified by herself and thus she ends her reflections i shall not live always may my closing scene be happy she had her wish it was happy we shall now according to the expectation given in the preface to this edition proceed to take brief notice of such other objections as have come to our knowledge for as is there said this work being addressed to the public as a history of life and manners those parts of it which are proposed to carry with them the force of example ought to be as unobjectionable as is consistent with the design of the whole and with human nature several persons have censured the heroine as too cold in her love too haughty and even sometimes provoking but we may presume to say that this objection has arisen from want of attention to the story to the character of clarissa and to her particular situation it was not intended that she should be in love but in liking only if that expression may be admitted it is meant to be everywhere inculcated in the story for example's sake that she never would have married mr lovelace because of his immoralities had she been left to herself and that of her ruin was principally owing to the persecutions of her friends what is too generally called love ought perhaps as generally to be called by another name cupidity or paphian stimulus as some women even of condition have acted are not words too harsh to be substituted on the occasion however grating they may be to delicate ears but take the word love in the gentlest and most honourable sense it would have been thought by some highly improbable that clarissa should have been able to show such a command of her passions as make so distinguishing a part of her character had she been as violently in love as certain warm and fierce spirits would have had her to be a few observations are thrown in by way of note in the present edition at proper places to obviate this objection or rather to bespeak the attention of hasty readers to what lies obviously before them 
for thus the heroine anticipates this very objection expostulating with miss howe on her contemptuous treatment of mr hickman which far from being guilty of the same fault herself she did on all occasions and declares she would do so whenever miss howe forgot herself although she had not a day to live oh my dear says she that it had been my lot as i was not permitted to live single to have met with a man by whom i could have acted generously and unreservedly mr lovelace it is now plain in order to have a pretence against me tax my behaviour to him with stiffness and distance you at one time thought me guilty of some degree of prudery difficult situations should be allowed for which often make seeming occasions for censure unavoidable i deserve not blame from him who made mine difficult and you my dear had i any other man to deal with than mr lovelace or had he but half the merit which mr hickman has would have found that my doctrine on this subject should have governed my whole practice it has been thought by some worthy and ingenious persons that if lovelace had been drawn an infidel or scoffer his character according to the taste of the present worse than sceptical age would have been more natural it is however too well known that there are very many persons of this cast whose actions discredit their belief and are not the very devils in scripture said to believe and tremble but the reader must have observed that great and it is hoped good use has been made throughout the work by drawing lovelace an infidel only in practice and this as well in the arguments of his friend belford as in his own frequent remorses when touched with temporary compunction and in his last scenes which could not have been made had either of them been painted as sentimental unbelievers not to say that clarissa whose great objection to mr wyerley was that he was a scoffer must have been inexcusable had she known lovelace to be so and had given the least attention to his addresses on the contrary thus she comforts herself when she thinks she must be his this one consolation however remains he is not an infidel an unbeliever had he been an infidel there would have been no room at all for hope of him but priding himself as he does in his fertile invention he would have been utterly abandoned irreclaimable and a savage and it must be observed that scoffers are too witty in their own opinion in other words value themselves too much upon their profligacy to aim at concealing it besides had lovelace added ribald jests upon religion to his other liberties the freedoms which would then have passed between him and his friend must have been of a nature truly infernal and this further hint was meant to be given by way of inference that the man who allowed himself in those liberties either of speech or action which lovelace thought shameful was so far a worse man than lovelace for this reason he is everywhere made to treat jests on sacred things and subjects even down to the mythology of the pagans among pagans as undoubted marks of the ill-breeding of the jester obscene images and talk as liberties too shameful for even rakes to allow themselves in and injustice to creditors and in matters of meum and tuum as what it was beneath him to be guilty of some have objected to the meekness to the tameness as they will have it to be of mr hickman's character and yet lovelace owns that he rose upon him with great spirit in the interview between them once when he thought her reflection was but implied on miss howe and another time when he imagined himself treated contemptuously miss howe it must be owned though not to the credit of her own character treats him ludicrously on several occasions but so she does her mother and perhaps a lady of her lively turn would have treated as whimsically any man but a lovelace mr belford speaks of him with honour and respect so does colonel morden and so does clarissa on every occasion and all that miss howe herself says of him tends more to his reputation than discredit as clarissa indeed tells her and as to lovelace's treatment of him the reader must have observed that it was his way to treat every man with contempt partly by way of self-exaltation and partly to gratify the natural gaiety of his disposition he says himself to belford thou knowest i love him not jack and whom we love not we cannot allow a merit to perhaps not the merit they should be granted modest and diffident men writes belford to lovelace in praise of mr hickman where not soon off those little precisenesses which the confident if ever they had them presently get over but as miss howe treats her mother as freely as she does her lover so does mr lovelace take still greater liberties with mr belford than he does with mr hickman with respect to his person air and address as mr belford himself hints to mr hickman and yet is he not so readily believed to the discredit of mr belford by the ladies in general as he is when he disparages mr hickman whence can this particularity arise mr belford had been a rake but was in a way of reformation mr hickman had always been a good man and lovelace confidently says 
that the women love a man whose regard for them is founded in the knowledge of them. Nevertheless, it must be owned that it was not purposed to draw Mr. Hickman as the man of whom the ladies in general were likely to be very fond. Had it been so, goodness of heart and gentleness of manners, great assiduity and inviolable and modest love, would not of themselves have been supposed sufficient recommendations. He would not have been allowed the least share of preciseness or formality, although those defects might have been imputed to his reverence for the object of his passion. But in his character it was designed to show that the same man could not be everything, and to intimate to ladies that in choosing companions for life they should rather prefer the honest heart of a Hickman, which would be all their own, than to risk the chance of sharing, perhaps with scores, and some of those probably the most profligate of the sex, the volatile, mischievous one of a loveless. In short, that they should choose, if they wish for durable happiness, for rectitude of mind, and not for speciousness of person or address, nor make a jest of a good man in favour of a bad one, who would make a jest of them, and of their whole sex. Two letters, however, by way of accommodation, are inserted in this edition, which perhaps will give Mr. Hickman's character some heightening with such ladies as love spirit in a man, and had rather suffer by it than not meet with it. Women, born to be controlled, stoop to the forward and the bold, says Waller, and loveless too. Some have wished that the story had been told in the usual narrative way of telling stories designed to amuse and divert, and not in letters written by the respective persons whose history is given in them. The author thinks he ought not to prescribe to the taste of others, but imagine himself at liberty to follow his own. He perhaps mistrusted his talents for the narrative kind of writing. He had the good fortune to succeed in the epistolary way once before. A story in which so many persons were concerned either principally or collaterally, and of characters and dispositions so various, carried on with tolerable connection and perspicuity, in a series of letters from different persons, without the aid of digressions and episodes foreign to the principal end and design, he thought had novelty to be pleaded for it, and that, in the present age, he supposed would not be a slight recommendation. Besides what has been said above and in the preface on this head, the following opinion of an ingenious and candid foreigner on this manner of writing may not be improperly inserted here. The method which the author had pursued in the history of Clarissa is the same as in the life of Pamela. Both are related in familiar letters by the parties themselves, at the very time in which the events happened, and this method has given the author great advantages, which he could not have drawn from any other species of narration. The minute particulars of events, the sentiments and conversation of the parties, are, upon this plan, exhibited with all the warmth and spirit that the passion supposed to be predominant at the very time could produce, and with all the distinguishing characteristics which memory can supply in a history of recent transactions. Romances in general, and Marivaux's amongst others, are wholly improbable, because they suppose the history to be written after the series of events is closed by the catastrophe, a circumstance which implies a strength of memory beyond all example and probability in the persons concerned, enabling them at the distance of several years to relate all the particulars of a transient conversation, or rather it implies a yet more improbable confidence and familiarity between all these persons and the author. There is, however, one difficulty attending the epistolary method, for it is necessary that all the characters should have an uncommon taste for this kind of conversation, and that they should suffer no event, not even a remarkable conversation, to pass, without immediately committing it to writing. But for the preservation of the letters once written, the author has provided with great judgment, so as to render this circumstance highly probable. This quotation is translated from a critique on the history of Clarissa, written in French and published at Amsterdam. The whole critique, rendered into English, was inserted in the Gentleman's Magazine of June and August 1749. The author has done great honour in it to the history of Clarissa, and as there are remarks published with it, which answer several objections made to different passages in the story by that candid foreigner, the reader is referred to the aforesaid magazine for both. It is presumed that what this gentleman says of the difficulties attending a story thus given in the epistolary manner of writing will not be found to reach the history before us. It is very well accounted for in it how the two principal female characters came to take so great a delight in writing. Their subjects are not merely subjects of amusement, but greatly interesting to both. Yet many ladies there are who now laudably correspond, when at distance from each other, on occasions that far less affect their mutual welfare and friendships than those treated of by these ladies. The two principal gentlemen had motives of gaiety and vainglory for their inducements. It will generally be found that persons who have talents for familiar writing as these correspondents are presumed to have, will not forbear amusing themselves with their pens on less arduous occasions than what offer to these. 
These four, whose stories have a connection with each other, out of the great number of characters who are introduced in this history, are only eminent in the epistolary way. The rest appear but as occasional writers, and as drawn in rather by necessity than choice, from the different relations in which they stand with the four principal persons. The length of the piece has been objected to by some, who perhaps looked upon it as a mere novel or romance, and yet of these there are not wanting works of equal length. They were of opinion that the story moved too slowly, particularly in the first and second volumes, which are chiefly taken up with the altercations between Clarissa and the several persons of her family. But is it not true that those altercations are the foundation of the whole, and therefore a necessary part of the work? The letters and conversations, where the story makes the slowest progress, are presumed to be characteristic. They give occasion, likewise, to suggest many interesting personalities, in which a good deal of the instruction essential to a work of this nature is conveyed. And it will, moreover, be remembered that the author, at his first setting out, apprised the reader that the story, interesting as it is generally allowed to be, was to be principally looked upon as the vehicle to the instruction. To all which we may add that there was frequently a necessity to be very circumstantial and minute, in order to preserve and maintain that air of probability which is necessary to be maintained in a story designed to represent real life, and which is rendered extremely busy and active by the plots and contrivances formed and carried on by one of the principal characters. Some there are, and ladies too, who have supposed that the excellencies of the heroine are carried to an improbable and even to an impracticable height in this history. But the education of Clarissa from early childhood ought to be considered as one of her very great advantages, as indeed the foundation of all her excellencies, and it is to be hoped, for the sake of the doctrine designed to be inculcated by it, that it will. She had a pious, well-read, a not meanly descended woman for her nurse, who with her milk, as Mrs. Harlow says, gave her that nurture which no other nurse could give her. She was very early happy in the conversation visits of her learned and worthy Dr. Lewin, and in her correspondences not with him only, but with other divines mentioned in her last will. Her mother was, upon the whole, a good woman, who did credit to her birth and fortune, and both delighted in her for those improvements and attainments which gave her, and them in her, a distinction that caused it to be said that when she was out of the family it was considered but as a common family. She was, moreover, a country lady, and, as we have seen in Miss Howe's character of her, took great delight in rural and household employments, though qualified to adorn the brightest circle. It must be confessed that we are not to look for Clarissa's name among the constant frequenters of Rainley and Vauxhall, nor among those who may be called daughters of the card-table. If we do, the character of our heroine may then, indeed, only be justly thought not improbable, but unattainable. But we have neither room in this place nor inclination to pursue a subject so invidious. We quit it, therefore, after we have repeated that we know there are some, and we hope there are many, in the British dominions, or there are hardly anywhere in the European world, who, as far as occasion has called upon them to exert the like humble and modest, yet steady and useful virtues, have reached the perfections of a Clarissa. Having thus briefly taken notice of the most material objections that have been made to different parts of this history, it is hoped we may be allowed to add, that had we thought ourselves at liberty to give copies of some of the many letters that have been written on the other side of the question, that is to say, in approbation of the catastrophe, and of the general conduct and execution of the work, by some of the most eminent judges of composition in every branch of literature, most of what has been written in this postscript might have been spared. But as the principal objection with many has lain against the length of the piece, we shall add to what we have said above on that subject, in the words of one of those eminent writers, that if, in the history before us, it shall be found that the spirit is duly diffused throughout, that the characters are various and natural, well distinguished and uniformly supported and maintained, if there be a variety of incidents sufficient to excite attention, and those so conducted as to keep the reader always awake, the length, then, must add proportionably to the pleasure that every person of taste receives from a well-drawn picture of nature. But where the contrary of all these qualities shock the understanding, the extravagant performance will be judged tedious, though no longer than a fairy tale. Finis. End of conclusion, part two. Recording by Nicole Lee. End of Clarissa Harlow, or the History of a Young Lady, volume nine, by Samuel Richardson.